Um, All right, if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Exodus chapter 3. We are continuing in our simple series, uh, and the title for today is Simple, Moses and the Burning Bush. And when we are in our simple series, if you haven't been here, if you don't know what that means, simple just means clear, not complicated, easy to understand, simplified, transferable principles. Real simple, right? It, it's, it doesn't mean we're watering down the Bible or the gospel. It doesn't mean that there's nothing to pull from there. It just means we want to look at stories. Most of these stories are pretty well-known stories. I mean, we mostly all heard of Moses and the burning bush, right? But we're looking at these stories that we've seen a million times, probably in, in, in kids' church and Sunday school and all that, and see if we could just simply pull out some gospel truths out of there and some life application that might just help us in our lives today. So Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1 here. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that uh, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. Uh, Yeah, I bet you would. He's he's like, I'm going to, this is kind of odd. This bush is on fire and it's, but it's not being consumed. It's not being burnt up. I'm going to go check this out. Sure. Verse four, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. Now, does anybody know why God said his name twice? I don't know either. I was was asking you guys. Um, We we do see this in Scripture sometimes. Remember when Saul uh, was on his way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's the same principle. It's really just really trying to get his attention, really making him know, hey, this is important. Not like, oh, you know, if God, you know, just audibly a voice spoke and said, Trevor, you know, oh, I I would ignore it the first time. I need it two times. Not exactly like that, but it was really pinpointing the fact that this was important. I am going to speak something to you. So Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now, I want to talk about this ground a little bit. This was the wilderness. This was kind of a a desert. This was rocky, mountainous. Uh, When it says wilderness, oftentimes we think of like trees and forests. That's that's not it. This was basically desert. It was just sand and dust and a little bit of grass here and there, and he was taking his flocks of sheep from place to place to try to find somewhere for them to eat. And God says, hey, you need to take off your sandals because where you are standing is holy. Now, again, just a rocky, dusty area, what made that ground holy? God did. God's presence specifically made it holy. See, God's presence makes ordinary places holy. Now, that we pretty much know that, but here's where I want to take God's presence makes ordinary people holy. Now, when I use that word holy, I don't mean like, like sinless. We, we know, you know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, so nobody is holy in that sense, but we can have the holiness of God in us. That's the same concept as righteousness. We take on God's righteousness. That's how we can enter into eternity with him, is that we take on God's righteousness. So God's presence in ordinary people makes them holy. Verse six, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, 
I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, Termites, and Jebusites. I'm just kidding. It doesn't say termites. I'm just a little bitter at termites because I had to tent my house a couple months ago, so I'm, I'm still bitter. Okay. Had to throw them in there to the list of the bad guys. Verse 9. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, I want us to pause for a minute because this begs a question. And again, when we read Scripture, and hopefully you are reading Scripture on your own, when we read it, it's really important not just to blow through it and say, okay, check. We need to read it, and we need to ask ourselves questions. We need to say, why did that happen? Why did it go down like this? What is God trying to do there? What is God showing them there? And so I came up with a question here. Here's a question. Why did God allow them to endure years of slavery before he decided to deliver them? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, it's a fair question. Why did God allow them to go through just all those years of hard work and labor and, and difficulty and they were crying out? Why did God do that? God's good, right? God's gracious, God's loving, he's kind, he is all those things. Why would a good God allow them, to, his people, his chosen people to go through that? And see, here's, here's why this is so important. Because when we dig into questions like this, we understand how God works. When you don't understand how God works, what do we do? We make assumptions. We say, well, God must not be good because if those were his people and he loves them, then he let them go through that. So God must not be good. Or, or we, we make wrong assumptions about God. But when we dig in and we understand how God works, it, it helps us because guess what? You might not be a, a slave to Egypt, but you're going to have a hardship in life. And you're going to go, God, why are you allowing me to go through this? God, if you're such a loving God, why, why is it that you are allowing me to endure this pain day in and day out, and it never seems like it's going to stop? I came up with three answers. I, I know there's, there's plenty, plenty more, but I think we just need to hone in on three. So number one, why did he allow them to endure years of slavery before he decided to deliver them? Number one, to get them to realize their need for him. They needed to understand they needed him. And he allowed them to go through this time to finally get to that point where they're like, we've got to cry out to God. In fact, in verse 7, it says, I have heard them crying out. They were desperate. They had probably tried a lot of other things. And we read in other parts of Scripture that they had, they had tried the gods of the Egyptians. And they finally reached out to God and said, God, we need you deliver us from this. So that's the first one. Number two is to get them out of their comfort zone enough to want to leave. You know that when we are in a hardship or in difficult times and, and, and we're struggling in things, yes, we want out of it, but do you know we often fall into this slump of just kind of comfort and we just don't have the energy to try to get ourselves out of it? And God wanted them to hit that kind of rock bottom point that they were out of their comfort zone. They're like, okay, it's, it, we're going to cross through the desert. That's going to be a difficult task, but God, we need you. We trust you. We, 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 and, and in Exodus chapter 14, verse 12, and many places as we read through, we're not going to today, obviously, for time, but as we read through this journey to the promised land, they're, they're just, they, they keep complaining and, and, and wanting to go back to Egypt. In Exodus 14, it says, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. 
like, like they, they hit that point where they wanted to leave, but then they, 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 they wanted to go back to their bondage. And we do the same thing. God wants to deliver us out of whatever that bondage it is in your life. And, 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 but, but we just, we, 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 we keep going back to it. God says, no, I have delivered you out of that. So why did God allow them to endure years of slavery before he decided to deliver them? Number one, to get them to realize their need for him. Number two, to get them out of their comfort zone enough to want to leave. Now, you're not going to like this last one, okay? And here's how I know you're not going to like the last reason. Because I don't like the last reason. Because I want answers for things. So number three, the reason is I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why God allowed them so much time in there. I mean, we know some, number one and number two, and there's probably some other reasons, but I don't know. Why does God allow us to go through things for so long? When we are crying out to him, when we are trusting in him, when we are turning to him, when we think that we have learned everything that we need to learn in that situation, why does he allow us to continue to go through those things? I don't know. But I want to teach you something. You know what you do when you don't know something? When you don't have an answer for something? Number one, you just admit you don't know. Like, like as Christians, we get asked questions by, by doubting people and, and good questions, and we make up an answer. Don't do that, okay? That, that's, that's, that's not a good um, way to have conversation with people sharing your faith. It's okay to say, I don't, I don't, you know what, that's a great question. I would love to know the answer to that question. I don't know, but you know what, give me some time and I can find that answer for you and I'll get back with you. So that's the first thing. But when you're faced with, I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know why God is doing that. You, you know what we need to do and it's so important? You go back to what you do know about God. That God is good, that he is faithful, that you have seen him come through so many times. He's come through before, he's, he's done it before, he will do it again. That's what we need to go to. These, these two verses, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, they're, they're iconic verses. We, you know, most of us have them memorized, we memorize them as kids, but they're just so true. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Why am I going through this, God? It doesn't make sense. No, no, no. That's your understanding, God would say. It makes perfect sense when you're looking at it from my view. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. And then here's the key. In all your ways, submit to him or acknowledge him, as some translations say. And he will make your paths straight. Here's our first point. Simple followers of Jesus trust Jesus no matter what. No matter what. No matter what the circumstance looks like, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how much pain there is, no matter how confusing it is, we trust Jesus no matter what. I came up with a definition of trust as it pertains to today. Here it is. Trust is Believing God has your best interest in mind, even when it doesn't look like it. That's what trust is. Or you could say, believing God has your best interest in mind, even when it just doesn't make any sense. Or even when you disagree with how God is doing something. That's what trust is. And Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? Just a little bit? all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Understanding, clarity, foresight, those are luxuries, okay? When we have those, when we have understanding about how God is working, that's awesome. But they're not requirements of faith. Sometimes we do get to have some clarity or some understanding, but they're not requirements of following God. Verse 10, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I want us to look at these two verses for a minute. It sounds humble, doesn't it? Moses sounds like he's being humble in this. He's like, who am I? I'm not worthy. I'm not, I don't have the ability to do this, God. It, it, it sounds humble, but it's not. Now, I, I want you to look at verse 10. Okay, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Who's the main character in verse 10? Who is it? Look at, look at the pronouns. It's God. Okay, so now go. I, God speaking, am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, okay? The main focus or the main character in that verse is God. Look at verse 11. Who's the main character in that? Moses. So Moses takes something, a statement from God, and what does he do? He turns it around and makes it about himself. Ooh. Might not have seen it like that before, did we? When, when God calls us to do something and we make excuses, oh, God, I'm not worthy. Like, God, God, I don't have the ability to do that. Oh, oh God, you can't use me. Oh, woe is me. That, 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 that whole kind of self-deprivation thing that Moses is doing here. Guess what? Who is that still about? It's about you. It's about Moses. He's like, it, that, that just, it's about self. And when God calls us, he's saying, no, 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 I don't, I, don't, I don't need your abilities. I'm pretty sure I can do this without your help, but I'm going to do it through you. It's not about you, Moses. It's about God. It's about his people, and it's about what God is doing. Verse 12. This is probably the biggest statement in this entire story that we're reading today. And God said, I will be with you. Now, I missed this the first couple times that I read this story because I, I read through the, the, the passage several times and trying to see what direction I should take and all that. And, and we read, I will be with you. And of course, God's going to be with him. I mean, that's what God does, right? That's kind of a God thing is to be with people. And so we would kind of expect that from God. So this wouldn't, this wouldn't necessarily catch you at first as anything different. But there's the answer right there. This statement from God should have been enough. Moses is like, who am I? No, no, I'm going to be with you. Oh, well, in that case, okay. Right? That's how it should have been. But realize what Moses had already. He saw a burning bush, okay, that wasn't being burned up. It was just fire there, right? Um, he heard God's audible voice. That's kind of crazy. That would freak any of us out, right? Um, he, he knew that God knew his name because God said his name twice. Moses, Moses. Okay, I know God knows my name, but to hear God audibly say my name, that would certainly get my attention and hopefully my trust. Um, he already knew the promises of God that God was going to deliver his people. And, and now God, God promises his presence would go with him to do this humongous task. Now, granted, it was a huge task that God was charging him to do. And now he knows that God is going to be with him. That should have been enough, shouldn't it? I would love to say if I was put in this situation, that would be enough for me. I don't know. I don't want to fault Moses too much here, but... God's presence in our lives, and we just sang that in that song. I, I, I love that that song could not have been more perfect. I speak Jesus, and we'll get to that here in a minute. But thankfully, Moses, 30 chapters later, finally gets it. And I, I think he got it before that. But one of my favorite passages in, is in Exodus chapter 33. And, and the, 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 he's he's telling them, okay, I want you to take the people 
to the promised land. And, and the whole golden calf thing had just happened, and God was so mad at the children of Israel. Like they had just completely turned their backs on God almost right away. And God's like, okay, here's how this is going to go, Moses. You're going to take them into the promised land. I, I promised you that, the land flowing with milk and honey. You're going to lead them there. But I'm sorry, I can't go with you. Like, if I go with you, if I'm with these people for any, any time longer, I'll destroy them. That's how mad I am at them. That's what God was telling Moses. And Moses said, no, 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 God, listen, I, I don't care how good that land is. If you don't go with me, I don't want to go. If your presence doesn't go with us, I, I, I don't want to go there. So thankfully, later on down the road, Moses got it. But at this point, it still wasn't enough for him. Verse 12, and God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Now that was grace. God overlooked Moses' self-centeredness and his just self-deprivation and just all of this, and he promises him a sign. He says, uh, okay, I'll even give you a sign that, it, that this is me and that this is going to happen. Now, granted, it was a promise. It was a future post-Exodus sign that when you lead these people out, you will worship back here on this mountain. God promises them. Verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose, what's that next word? I, ugh. Now he turns it back, makes it about himself again. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Now, that sounds like a reasonable request. All right. Um, okay. God, um, w w when they ask, okay, okay, God appeared to you. Sure, he did. Okay. And told you to take us out of here. Pharaoh's going to destroy us. Like, what's this God's name? It sounds like a reasonable request. But actually what Moses is doing is he's starting this pattern of excuses and trying to find reasons why he shouldn't be the one. And we're not going to see them all today. Later on, you can read through chapter 4 and just see how over and over and over he does this type of thing. But it is a reasonable request. But this leads us to our next point. Simple followers of Jesus know that a lack of knowledge, understanding, or ability does not negate the commands of God. Knowledge, understanding, or ability does not negate the commands of God. We have a saying now that kind of goes along with this. Does anybody know where I'm going? Ignorance, yeah, ignorance is no excuse, or ignorance of the law, sometimes we say, is no excuse. It's kind of along the same path here. It's, it's uh, you know, oh, oh I, I, don't, I just don't have enough knowledge, or I don't have the ability to do that, God, so you can't call me to that. God, I know you're telling me to do specific things, but I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not good enough to do that. So God, you should probably choose someone else. Now, now here's, I, I wrote down some ways that we actually do this kind of in real life here. Um, we know that as Christians, we're supposed to share our faith, right? That we're supposed to live differently in this world. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5, it calls it salt and light. We're supposed to be salt and light to this world. So we know we're supposed to share our faith. But, but a lot of times we say, well, I don't, I don't really, I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't know enough Bible verses to share my faith. You know, that's a cop out. I don't remember reading the verse that says, hey, in order for you to be a light, you've got to go quote a bunch of scripture to them. Now, is it a good thing to know scripture? Absolutely. Okay, can we use scripture? But what is oftentimes very applicable when we go 
share our faith with someone. I kind of just gave it away. But what, but what, what can we use that's, that's different from just starting and just quoting verses? What, what do we have that we can share? Our story. Exactly. Our testimony. Hey, yeah, you're, I, don't, I don't know a whole lot of Bible verses in that, but let, let me just tell you what God's done in my life. Like, I was this, and God has brought me to this. Like, like there's no way I could have gotten from here to here on my own. Because I, w- what I was trying wasn't working. And when I finally met Jesus and gave my life to him, everything changed. See that? So, oh, I don't, I don't know enough about the Bible. Or um, I need to clean up my act before I go to church. Mm, have you heard that one before? I, I, need, I need to get some things straightened out. No, there's an old hymn. We used to sing it about every week. Come just as you are. Right. We got some old timers in here, right, that used to sing the hymns. I love them. Okay, maybe can we can do that one next week. Okay. You heard it. He shook his head yes. Come just, I'm just kidding. Come just as you are. Not get cleaned up and come to church or come to Jesus first. That's not how it works. You can't clean yourself up anyway. Okay, how about this one? Um, I can't afford to be generous and tithe to my local church. I've heard that one a lot. There's a, a, a couple that goes here, and I've heard them say it multiple times and talking about giving and that, and I, I love this phrase. They say, we can't afford to not tithe. We can't afford to not do that because we have seen how God has blessed in such amazing ways. And, and uh, I, I explained a couple weeks ago, God's math is different than our math. You do know that, right? Like God does math differently, and, and I don't do math well anyway. Okay, but his math works out way better than my math. So, so not having knowledge or understanding or, or ability doesn't stop us from having to be what God has called us to be. We make ridiculous excuses about why we can't obey God. And, and Moses was like, God, I just, I, I can't speak for you. I don't even know your name. Like, they're gonna ask me what your name is, and I don't, I don't know what your name is. So, so like, I, I can't do this. Well, in his defense, the Egyptians, and remember, yes, Moses was a Hebrew, but he was raised in the Egyptian culture. The Egyptians had just numerous gods. They had a god for everything. They had, uh, and, and each of the gods had a very personal name. They had a sun god. Anybody know the sun god's name? Ra, okay, they had a moon god, they had a river god, they had a crocodile god, they had a frog god, they had all of these different gods, and all of these gods had a very personal name. So I get where Moses is coming from and saying, listen, they're going to ask me your name because all of these gods, and even though, okay, we're Hebrews, we have the one true God, they were still immersed in Egyptian culture. They're going to ask, God, what is your name? I I need to know your name. Verse 14. Two more verses to go. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord The God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. That's how they would have known God. That's how they would have called him. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Here's our third and final point. Simple followers of Jesus know that God is everything you need. God is absolutely everything that you need. He may not be everything that you want in this life, but I promise you he is everything that you need. Now I want to talk about this name, I am. This, this concept, I, I think this is one of those things where it is just right there at the realm of my simple human brain cannot truly fathom what this means. 
okay, there's a few things about God that I, I read about God and I try to understand about God and I just have to accept, listen, my puny little human mind, I, I don't fully get this. I trust what it means and I, I know the little bit that I know about it, but, but I'll put it this way. The moment that you think you have God fully figured out, mm, we need to talk about that, okay? I think this is one of those things. And God says, my name is I am. Now, in our English, would that be complete? Not really, right? You are what? You would put something after that. Well, here's what most scholars think that this I am means. It's all-encompassing is what God is trying to say here. It means the eternal now. Now, those two words together don't even work, do they? Eternal means eternal, right? Okay, and now means now. It's kind of an oxymoron. You can't be eternal and now at the same time, I guess unless you're God. So I am, you are what? I am. I am the eternal now. I am the ever-present one is another way to say it, or the ever-existent one, or the all-eternal one. I think that's what God is trying to say here. Just, I am, you are what? Yes. That's it, and that should be enough. Now, I I, I did a little bit deeper of a dive on this, and here's what what some scholars and pastors and theologians believe. I am means... The ever and all becoming one. It's this idea that God is what you need of Him in that moment. God is and becomes what you need in your situation in life. You need comfort, you need healing, you need strength, you need peace. Yes, I am. God is saying, I am those things, the ever and all becoming one. Now, it goes along with the personal name of God. We say Yahweh or Jehovah, but this word Yahweh, we spell it Y-A-H-A-W-H, Yahweh. I think I got that right. Okay, the, in the original Hebrew, there were no vowels. Okay, you're going to get a little Hebrew lesson here. There were no vowels. So it's spelled Y-H-W-H. It's kind of hard to print. How do you pronounce that? You kind of don't. I'll put it that way. Except I wasn't even looking for it, and I saw this thing on Friday, and I, again, it's one of those things where I'm kind of like barely grasping it. And this guy just started talking about Yahweh, the name of God, as we would pronounce it, Yahweh with the vowels. But he said the true pronunciation of Y-H-W-H, you don't close your mouth and you don't move your tongue. Now, it's kind of hard to speak if you don't close your mouth and use your tongue. That's how we put uh, sounds together, right? So let me show you how you would pronounce Yahweh in the original form. What is that? It's breath. And I I don't know if God set it up like this. I don't know if this is just some cool play on. I don't know. What I do know is when a child is born and they take that first breath, what an amazing symbol that that first breath they are taking in God's name. It enters into their body and gives them life. Now, we know life happens way, way, way before that different discussion, okay? But they are taking in that breath of God. In Genesis, it said God breathed his life or his spirit into Adam. And what is the last thing that we do on this earth? We breathe out God's name. I thought that was so powerful. Just, it's, I am. God, you, you, are, you are 
everything that I need. You are the breath in my lungs. You are the, you are the peace that I need, the joy that I need, everything that I need. I am. That's what God is. God becomes what you need. We see this. One of these days, I want to do a study on the names of God. I wrote down just a few of these, and then we'll close out. We all know this one, Jehovah Jireh. What does that mean? My God provides. Or my God is a provider. Yahweh, Jehovah. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. That's that righteousness that I talked about, that, that we get to take on God's righteousness. It doesn't mean we are perfect, but it's that righteousness that is required for us to spend eternity with him. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Jehovah Ra, the Lord our shepherd. And this last one, you could probably figure it out what it is. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. The ever and all becoming one. That's who God is. God's not some old man up in the sky and he did some cool things before and he got this world started out and he's just kind of sitting back in his rocking chair with his big long gray beard and saying, I hope it works out for you guys. Nope, that's not God. He's not this police officer who's, who's just up there you know, with a, you know, a big stick ready to you know, whack somebody every time they do bad. That's not God. He is the ever and all becoming one, the I am. I'll close with this, a little bit of a tangent here, but I, I can't let it go. Some say Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus was, he was a great teacher. Jesus was a prophet. Oh, you know, he was, he was, a, he was such a good dude, man. Nope, nope, he didn't claim to be any of those things. He claimed to be God. And people would argue that all day long because they have a problem if it's proven that Jesus is God. Multiple places Jesus claims it, but I want to give you probably the strongest place that I believe, the strongest evidence that I believe that Jesus claimed to be God. And it's in John chapter 8, verse 58. And he says, Before Abraham was, I am. Wait a minute, Jesus takes the name of God. Now, when he was speaking, they would have had two options to believe here. They would have, number one, believed that Jesus was claiming to be, be born before Abraham, which would have been a couple thousand years before that, okay? Obviously, that was not true because when Jesus was crucified, he was 33 years old. All right, so obviously, he wasn't claiming to be older than Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. He was claiming to be God. Now, okay, great. He said that, but maybe he meant something else. Maybe, oh, that's not really what he meant. No, the following verse, does anybody know what happened at that moment? It says they picked up stones and they tried to stone him because of blasphemy. Like that was a capital crime because they knew he was in that moment claiming to be God. Jesus was the I am here on earth. Don't ever let anyone tell you Jesus did not claim to be God. Absolutely. John 8, verse 58, along with many other places in Scripture. So three characteristics of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus trust Jesus no matter what. Number two, simple followers of Jesus know that a lack of knowledge, understanding, or ability does not negate the commands of God. And number three, simple followers of Jesus know that God is everything that you need, the I am. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the I am, that you are the ever and all becoming one. You are Yahweh. You are our God. Thank you, God, that you become what we need in our circumstances, in our situations, in our problems, in our storms, in our lives, God, that you are everything that we need. God, help us to trust you no matter what. Even when things don't look like 
they're gonna work out. God, we know that you are in control. God, help us to believe that. God, I know that there are people in this room right now struggling with that, struggling to believe that they can trust you. God, they, they, they've heard everything about you and your goodness and all of that, and they're just struggling to truly grasp it, to grasp your goodness, to grasp your true nature of a loving, forgiving God. Right now in this moment, Lord, would you speak to their hearts? Let them know that you love them that you care about them, that you want to deliver them, but you want to teach them. God, I thank you that you teach us through our issues and our problems and our hurts and our pains. God, you are just trying to refine us in the fire. Thank you, God, that you care enough to know our names. Each and every single one of us, God, Your word says, you know the number of hairs on our head. That is a personal, loving God. Thank you for that, Lord. God, right here and right now in this moment, if there are some in this room that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they have not started a relationship with you, maybe they've believed some stuff about the Bible, maybe they've relied on their good works or their church attendance, or they just don't know. They just don't know they can have assurance of spending eternity with you in heaven. Right now in this moment, God, would you speak to their hearts? God, may your spirit convict them. Let them know that they need a savior from their sins. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, that you have not made that commitment to him to say, Jesus, you are my everything. I give my life to you, Jesus. I've tried it all myself. I've tried to fix this sin problem and all this junk. It doesn't work. If that's you, I wanna give you an opportunity this morning to trust in Jesus and make him your savior. It's something that you only have to do once. So right now in this moment, with heads bowed, eyes closed, right where you're seated, just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I trust that you died on a cross and took my sin took my place on that cross and not only died but three days later you rose again proving victory over death over sin so Jesus I trust you this morning God save me God change me I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to make a deal of it or call you up front, anything like that. I would just love to know. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it today for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Today, I trusted Jesus as my Savior. I gave him my life for the very first time today. God, thank you that you are a good God. Thank you that you are the I am, that you are everything that we need. God, when the worries and troubles and deception of this world tug at us, God, help us to keep our eyes focused on you because you are good, because you are. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be generous. Help us to be a generous church in this community and in this world so that we can further your kingdom in all kinds of different ways. Lord, we love you. We praise you. 
And it is in the awesome, most precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.